welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep. I'm your host, Grace Helbig. Very excited to have actress, uh, wonderlust enthusiast, Holland Roden here with us on today's episode. We talk all about, you know, obviously booking Teen Wolf, what her life has been like uh, going from studying science, medicine, and doctoral type of things and transitioning into entertainment. And then also she did this really freaking cool thing at the beginning of the pandemic. She bought a van and totally fixed the whole thing up uh, all because she DM'd a guy that knew about vans over in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, spent four months doing it. She's actually podcasting me uh, with me from said van and gives anyone that's interested in getting into that kind of lifestyle a lot of really great advice. A lot of it has to do with um, thinking thoughtfully about urination. Specific, specifically your urination. You'll understand when we get to that. Also, she gives me a ton of documentary recommendations. Uh, we could have talked for hours about social media, all of it. This is just a really lovely episode. So I hope you enjoy Not Too Deep with Holland Roden. <laughs> Okay, I I am seeing that you are in your van. I am. I oh. am in my van. <laughs> okay, I have so many. We're going to get to van okay. and that whole journey in a little bit. But I got to, I, I want to know more about how you got to Los Angeles. Because I know hmm. you double majored. And so I'm curious how the shift from school into like entertainment happened for you. Yeah, I uh, went to this all girls school for about 11 years, like five till 16. So that was the majority wow. of my foundation. And I played soccer and was a dancer and nowhere near the arts. Um, okay. Except for the fact that like on the weekends, I would like force my parents and my parents' friends to watch like my made up plays I would put out in the living room. <laughs> okay, so, so you had like, like a seed of something. Absolutely. In yeah. I mean, my, I still to this day, my most depressed moment is when... Um, is when a movie ends like that like the toilets roll and the lights come up it's like a very somber depressing moment for me yeah. um it's like this wave of sadness just hits me so I always love storytelling I loved history class because if, if you put it in story form mm -hmm. I'm all ears and so that was sort of the subconscious foundation and when I was I transferred to a new public school where there was boys at 16 whoa and what was that like was that it was a major like what essential mean girls? Uh Tina really? Fey was speaking my language, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And so I knew what it was like to be hated, what it's like to be judged, what Whoa. it's like. I was like, oh, I, this is my breeding ground for Hollywood. Yeah, um, yeah truly. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it was awful. And so, but it was really there that I explored, you know, acting as a hobby and acting, um, joining an acting class. And mm -hmm. it was over a local agency in Texas. And so I would go twice a week and it was sort of, I called it like the Veda of my girl. Cause it was like the adult pottery class where like yeah, this yeah. just showing up, you know, <laughs> this kid, um, amongst these adults. And, um, yeah, I, I was way out of my league, but I loved it. And, and the guy pulled me over, he's kind of Ken Farmer mm -hmm. and I took from him for a couple of years and he's like, I think you should do this professionally. If you want to sign with someone downstairs, I know that they'd be interested in signing you. And so wow. that's kind of how it started. And professionally, I say, I, um, I didn't really do it professionally until I was like, okay, I'll go to college and in, in, in California, mm -hmm. get my grades under control. If that's fine as a sophomore, then I'll, then I'll get into it. And I had a friend that I did like a short film with, um, cool. back in the Texas days. So it was a long pr progression to get, to get into it professionally. I was a late bloomer. I mean, professionally with like headshots and, and yeah. LA agency, I was 21. But so, you, yeah. it's interesting. Cause it does seem like you had a very like, um, rational approach to it that like let me get my grounding let me have like a, a bit of uh some more formal education and this yeah. will hover around me and we'll see what happens with it i'm the queen of a backup of the backup of the backup plan. <laughs> so so that was that was my thing and i got lucky and a couple months into acting um i think it was like yeah i, I booked this little hbo comedy show that mm -hmm. um we filmed all six episodes i mean i think we had a a com uh, like a promo during the Sopranos finale. And then because of the writer's strike and some behind the scenes, I think trouble at the executive level, um, mm. inappropriateness, mm, some few moments, mm -hmm. they've departed. And when the new regime stepped in, 
they were like, what are you, what is this comedy show? And I, apparently we were pretty expensive paying for, you know, big co- comedic salaries. Lily Tomlin was on the show, show oh, Gary cool. Cole, um, Kathleen Lanaza, Mary Kay Place. It was a great, it was a great cast. So wow. um, they canceled our entire season without it airing. <gasps> and about a year later, I was a senior at that point in college. I booked Teen Wolf. So wow. um, that's kind of the long short of it. Yeah. So you also got what seems like a very full Hollywood experience of shooting something, getting a gig and then having it completely taken away from you out of your control. (laughs) Yeah, that that happened. And then Teen Wolf between the pilot, we auditioned in 09. Okay. And it aired in 11. (laughs) Wow. What was the audition process like for that? Um, I went in for uh, Crystal's role initially for Allison and uh, Lydia was written as a uh, model off the runways of Milan. And so... (laughs) And you're like, I got why. this. This is got, what I've yeah, been preparing I'm for. <laughs> I'm going to go straight to a test. Um, and so I thought that was funny. I was like, well, I'm not booking that. But they brought me back for Lydia. They said, you know, we, we got our girl. Ironically, mm-hmm. like she kind of looked like a model off the runways of Milan. Um, mm. the, the woman who played uh, Allison. But uh, yeah, I went back a couple months later and um, and yeah, sat in this room with a bunch of Italian looking models and I was like, okay, what can I do? I was like, I'll make her a genius. That maybe might be weird. And oh, I love cool. Alexander Payne. It's one of my favorite directors and election um, research spoon in that role. I mean, yeah. definitely role models. So uh, that was sort of the, the inspiration. And I guess, I guess they liked it and, and they hired a pale redhead as a popular girl, which... <laughs> Is very John Hughes good of them. So I think that I mean, what a bold choice to make. Uh, even though it doesn't yeah. seem like that, I'm sure in hindsight as much. The it must have been such a wild ride, I assume, the whole experience of Teen Wolf that like you're going into this thing not totally knowing, like any project, I guess, like how this is going to do. And your experience is that something you've done has gotten taken away from you. So it's like yeah. the yeah. continuous trust cycle in all of it. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I filmed something like 12 guest spots in that like 14 month period yeah. between the shows. And one of them was lost. And <laughs> Uh, it was quite funny because I was I, everything just felt like a student film to me because yeah. in my world things didn't really air. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Um, so that's kind of how I still feel to this day. Wow. When I film it, I just forget about it. After once it's coming out, it's like oh, I've already lived that. Right, I don't need to live it again. Um, so so yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of how I view it. I live very much in the filming process and not in the airing process. Yeah. yeah I mean, you have to, right. You have to like kind of let it go and let it yeah. have its own life, whatever that's going to be after you've given it as much. It's kind of, it right. must be like what parenting feels like that you like nurture something while you're there and then you let it do it. Past 18. I'm not responsible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of parents might feel that way. Too yeah. Many. I don't, I have a dog, so I don't really relate, but you also have a dog. I do. My little uh, baby. Yeah, Five uh, And did yep. you, how old is Five She, I think, is like 11 ish. Oh, um, wow. So she's a mature woman. She is. She's a curmudgeon old lady. And <laughs> she's very funny, but she's a champ. She, um, she's sleeping underneath my feet right now. Um, um, so yeah, she's a sweetie. Um, does she come on set with you? Does she do like the whole make the rounds with you? She does. I am, I am. Treated as a second class citizen because yeah. I have a dog at all <laughs> social situations or not social public situations mm-hmm. and constantly, you know, having getting that. The, I'm sure you relate the, the stairs uh-huh. and the ro- eye rolls. And oh, I'm totally. Like, My child behaves better than your human child. So I don't <laughs> want to hear it. Do you have a um, standout memory of the most ridiculous thing you've done for her that you maybe caught yourself going, yeah, this, I'm doing this? Like, my dog, Goose, she is also a curmudgeon old lady and is a okay. bit aggressive. So she's, you know, she just stays at home a lot. So we've become very attached. But she has, I think, mm-hmm. five dog beds throughout my place right now. Um, that is a bit much some people would consider. <laughs> she's a very supported spine. Yeah, I want to <laughs> I want I would want to know that I could sleep comfortably in any room that I'm in. So why would I not give that opportunity exactly. to her? Uh, what's the most outrageous thing you've done for your little lady? I was on the terrace no-fly list for a while because of my fault. 
<laughs> yeah, I got bad on U.S. Airways. Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah. It's a very long story. So the short of it is um, my friend said, you just sneak them past the check-in desk and then there's not a problem. That's literally so my friend Mamrie does that. Yeah. And, um, and so a flight attendant um, really wanted to take something to task. Ooh. And went to the extent where they were disrupting the entire area of the plane. And so on my layover, um, I just got out of the situation and was like, mm-hmm. the new gay agent won't know, you know, it's fine. <laughs> and it's, it was like the you know, meet the parents version of this, you know, of my life where it's like, mm-hmm. I scan the ticket and she like looks up and she's like, it's like that eh, eh, like you're not going oh, to no. and she's like please step aside ma'am i'm like what and she's like please step aside ma'am get it on their way and i was like oh sh- okay oh. so they're like you have to pay this much money and they were like tripling the price and they were yeah, I'm sure. keeping all the leftover yeah so I, I was they held the plane for 20 minutes so i was like this is ridiculous a Ugh. let me get another flight yeah B, this and they're like i was like i'll just book another airline and they're like it was a whole thing. And they're like, no, you oh. actually can't. You're, we've now placed you on a list that you can't buy <laughs> any American airline. So much effort to shame you in this experience. Absolutely. That, that's what, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think when, well, it's funny, at a Michelin star restaurant in, anywhere in France, they're like yeah. in the booth next to you and you don't have any <laughs> dog to human, you know, yeah. pandemic diseases going down. Yeah, Francis, exactly. You know, has, has fared okay for the last, you know, 300 years hanging out with dogs yeah. and treating them. Um, I guess in France, if, if you do abuse a dog, it's like, it's, it's treated as if you abuse a human. So they're the same sentencing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, all one and the same. So I, I really like how France appreciates <laughs> the canines. Um, yeah. I hope that that's, yeah, that I'm going to start using that, uh, and give that information to all my friends to use on their behalf of their dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. such a great way so, to put it. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, uh, Ted Bundy, uh, American Boogeyman. Um, this is a wild film for many reasons, obviously the content itself, uh, but you also shot this in the pandemic, right? You did, you were, yeah. That's yeah. crazy. And you're playing an FBI agent that's based on a woman, Kathleen McChesney. Is that how you say her name? Yeah, McChesney. Yeah, she was working for the Seattle Police Department mm-hmm. in the 70s and Clarice was based on her because um, she was one of the first people to really connects psychology and these sequ- they're called sequence killers at the time. Yeah. And, and think there could be an overlap of how to catch one. You don't look for evidence. You look from a psychological standpoint of yeah. where they could sort of strike next. And um, that's she from then because they caught Ted Bundy based off of her sort of pitch yeah. uh, to catch him from a psychological standpoint. Um, she is, like, well, she, I believe she just retired, but she was one of the top, uh, positions in the FBI for several decades now um, out of Los Angeles. Wow. So yeah, wow. she's had a really great career. And, what a um, badass. Yeah, she's, I mean, I had just read a book called To Catch a Killer out of a mm. South African book. And it was a similar story of a woman in the 80s um, mm. sort of using that same psychology wow. to, to catch people. And uh, it, long story short, the book rights just didn't work out. And then this project came to me and I was really excited that no, we don't need another Ted Bundy movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but what I liked about this is that Dan, the director, was telling it from the law enforcement's point of view, mm. which um, hadn't really been done before. And yeah. Kathleen is is a bit of a, an anomaly, especially for that time period. So it was a, a cool a cool character to step into. Do you follow true crime, any of that kind of stuff? Not really. No, no, I don't. So you really, then you really just took this on fully. Yeah, I I get too many nightmares. <laughs> I sleep at the top of mountaintops by myself. Yeah. No. Well, well okay, then let's talk about um, this like kind of other life that you have. You, yeah. in the pandemic, talk to me about this band journey. How did this happen for you? What What was the catalyst? Well, I had looked at band builds for probably since 2017 and uh-huh. I'm like, okay, well, there's so many ways to go about building one. Um, and most people, if you're going to do it on a budget of any kind, yeah. even a, a nicer band, they're all doing it themselves. Yeah. And I had no building experience and wow. um, yeah, I, I, I didn't really know how to go about doing it because everybody, mm. you know, just had backyard shops and did it themselves. 
So I, during the pandemic, had taken one of the builds that I really admired. The 144 Sprinter is what I have. And there was only one guy that I had found Mm -hmm. out of all the builds that had put a shower and a toilet in his 144. It's very difficult to get both in the size of a van. So and you so, had the you had your van already, and then no, I had oh, purchased no. it yet. I had just been okay. like lo- like looking at builds, what kind of van I should get, cool, um, and what kind of build I should do. And so yeah, I uh, I contacted him on Instagram. I had found him on a YouTube channel, like one of these tour th- situations, yeah. and they happened to put his handle in for Instagram in the in the description. So reached out to him on DMs, and he said, "Yeah, I'm home in Wisconsin, ironically, on my family's farm," because um, that was also sort of the catch was mm-hmm. these damn people are not going to get off the road to build your van. They, they don't care. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. not. so quarantine was lucky. It was like my one chance. And so he helped me say like, I, I found it up in you know, New York and I'm a mm-hmm. Texas girl, California now yeah, girl. And I was, I, I wasn't aware of this thing, of this thing called rust. Um, and he's like, don't buy a van from New York if you can. So it Helpful. never became a lot more expensive with him involved. Of like, yeah. if you can afford it, build on a nicer van yeah. and so I took his advice and did and so wow. yeah so then we took about four months um got the movie during building so I was like learning dialogue at night wow. and I had these, like, big monologues I think it was like 60 pages of just dialogue of me just rattling my my face off and so mm-hmm. I would have to go over those at night it was hard I mean yeah I was able to I, but I learned you know the jigsaw and the cirque saw and the miter saw and the table saw and um, it was awesome. I, I, I learned all about drills and, um, how to demo and how to make drawers and cabinets. Um, yeah, it sounds, um, I mean, it sounds amazing. It sounds a bit, you know, like, uh, like a dream, like a TV show, like a movie or something that you just like, I'm deciding. Cause it, it sounds, I'm always so, um, inspired by people that just kind of like go for it. Like something mm-hmm. that they're not familiar with, but they ask for help from the right people and then just sort of like make it happen was four months always the timeline for this no. or is that no okay two, we, i thought it would be like two maybe three months oh yeah and then the movie um put a big kink in things so mm-hmm. um yeah flying one of the first the pandemic this is when like you were like looking for dog masks it's yeah. you know, crazy <laughs> crazy stuff the one percentile of crazy uh-huh. and um it was us and Michael Bay shooting in Los Angeles and mm. he had his like own lab, you know, set up around his movie. Wow. So we did have one background positive case that had interacted with some of the crew. And so, we, you know, we're testing essentially every day at that point. We thankfully didn't have any zone A breaches and we were okay. Um, yeah. But flying out of Wisconsin and his parents are immunocompromised and they've become, his mom became one of my best friends. I just got Aww. back from visiting her in Wisconsin um, after shooting a project just now. And so, yeah, they become lifelong friends. She would, she so has a really interesting story. Um, and they're just an incredible family. And so they've, I've wow. become their like adopted daughter. Yeah. So um, did you stay yeah. with them while you were building? Wow. Yeah. Had a so bonus this, room. Wow. Yeah. So this became like a full, like a meshed situation based on a DM <laughs> from Instagram. I just showed up and was like, hi, I'm Holland. <laughs> I'm going to be staying with you guys. And basically, do her exchange student. <laughs> yeah, I pay crazy. rent. And um, and they had just finished their this beautiful farmhouse they had built. And so um there was no bathroom and, and shower okay. in there. And so they had a camper outside. And so I would use the camper for that stuff and then go up to the sleep of the bonus room. And then wow. they took that camper on the rope for like a, a month and a half as parents. Yeah. So then they're like, oh, just use the house. <laughs> and so I'm sitting like in this like beautiful state-of-the-art <laughs> farmhouse. I'm Cooking, it was just very bizarre, but, wow. but they were the coolest people. Um, she got a very interesting story. She was raised um, in the 70s in, a, in like a survivalist cult wow. um, up in Alaska. And so she's a tough woman and she lived without electricity and plumbing for about eight years. Um, What's and- a survivalist cult? Is that just basically like our mission is to survive, but to not use any modern technologies yes, or advances? Yes, they they really? believe that when the apocalypse comes, God wants <gasps> you to live off the land and Whoa. be prepared to do that. And it's called the hand of God. Is, is, is the I've heard of this. Yeah, I feel not, like I've not heard the of Phoenix's this. ones. That's children of God. But a hand oh, of that's God. what I'm thinking. Yeah. OK, a yeah, hand of God is this one. Yeah. And so. She's just got really interesting stories. I bet. And just such a cool woman and ended up leaving. And yeah. And oh my God. Yeah. yeah well, these people, the Wisconsinites, man, you got it. 
Madison, Wisconsin, I highly recommend. <laughs> really? It's really okay. It's a uh, city in, in America. It's one I of my know. favorite cities. Yeah. Not as many travel guides are featuring Madison, but maybe they should. They should. No fires, no earthquakes, wow. um, no tornadoes, tons of rain. I'm um, sold. Yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a little liberal city um, amongst a swing state. So it's sort of like wow. a bolder kind of vibe. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, we're going to take a, a break really quick. When we get back, I have a bunch more questions for you. Okay. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. <laughs> Hi, friends. Grace Helbig here from the podcast Not Too Deep, which you are currently listening to, hosted by me, Grace Helbig. Just wanted to say a couple of things. One, thank you so much for listening. And two, if you are enjoying yourself to such a degree that you'd love to leave us a um, review on the Apple Store, that would be so appreciated because again you are very appreciated for giving us your time your ears your attention whatever it may be uh and that was my couple of things now back to me me okay we're back in i'm curious now how long has it been with the van fully done in your life and what's life like with the van i've been in it for about nine months now okay um and i rented out my house and it's a lot harder i if anyone's looking into you know van life's synonymous mm-hmm. into the to just a house at this point it's pretty common um so i would say you know if you're looking to van life definitely test the mattress out in your in your back <laughs> of your of your truck yeah. and i did not do that although i did a lot of car sleeping mm. um i did i i am a person that loves naps and so yeah. when i was uh driving home from night shoots i wouldn't make it all the way home and i would just pull over in neighborhoods <laughs> and sleep i had pizzas that's, delivered to that car that's I'd amazing watch. So I, I knew you prepped. That, yeah, that was my prep. Um, yeah. But I yeah, I, I dove in pretty deep to build a whole house wow. and not really having done it full full time before. Um, so I yeah. got lucky. I love it. Um, I it have feels it. like I, sorry to cut you off. It feels no. like you have to live very intentionally. You do. Like you have to be very considerate of all the things you have the things you need like really need versus things you want and like okay. keeping everything clean collected and like together it feels like you have to be very something very mindful about it that seems very cool it is a very meditative experience um, yeah. it is slightly masochistic there's no doubt about that um, <laughs> yeah. you know and you're very well aware of the full process of your body like mm. you don't really think about if you're drinking much, that much water what is your pee schedule yeah. And how much pee you're actually producing in your body. <laughs> yes. You're not aware of that when it's going into a regular toilet. So That's very true. When it's going into a composting toilet, you know how much pee you really are, are excreting. Wow. So, yeah. You know what? I feel like that's great advice for anyone <laughs> that is looking to get into this kind of lifestyle. Because you know how much pee you really <laughs> that, How much pee do you produce a week? Um, yeah, get in touch with yeah. your body in a way you yeah. never thought you needed to before. Absolutely. But yeah, did you have any of those moments where you're like, "Wow, I'm a monster"? <laughs> like, and, <I> have... <laughs> and and you know, I have friends that I never knew. You know, I had to <laughs> clean up a lot of their pee when I would ever never go to bed with a full pee jug. That's advice number one. Okay, okay, don't do that. Um, or you, it's a, nope, don't do that. <laughs> um, but you learn a lot about composting toilets, and yeah. they are so much. I don't know if cleaner is necessarily the word, but. Mm-hmm. As far as aromas go, it's mm. only because there's liquid involved. So like porta potties or pit mm. toilets, um, the seek or, or simply water in a regular toilet. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no smell to a toilet um, uh, uh, if, if it's a dry toilet, if it's a composting yeah. toilet. Wow. And so people, there's, there's like a misnomer that like a bathroom stink. They don't yeah. stink. Um, composting toilets don't stink. Wow. And so it's just because there's water involved in a modern toilet. And huh. so, um, yeah, it's very, it's very funny to me that, you know, we actually That's don't blowing my mind right now. Yeah. So I'm just like <laughs> processing that. Yeah. That makes yeah. so much sense, but I would never have thought that out. Right. Uh-huh. Whoa. So that you learn everything, like I said, takes three times as long, but, yeah. um, I think, yeah, like I said, it's a meditative practice and you're so grateful for the tiniest little thing. And sure. you absolutely learn. I've already done two clean outs in nine months of just trying uh-huh. to get more 
stuff out of the van versus yeah. in the van. Um, and I love skiing. That's, that's one of the reasons why I did it. I wanted to see oh, national cool. parks. I wanted to see more of like the country I live in. Yeah. You can also put it on a ferry and in 10 days it's in Europe from the Whoa. East coast. Yeah. This doesn't take as long as one would think. And my goal is to huh. travel Europe and then do North Africa as well. Oh, um, hell yeah. I was just um, going to ask what's coming up next now that you have the van, have van yeah. will travel. Is that the, that's the idea? That's the idea. Uh, I got to do four ski trips in two cool. months with cool. 20 minutes notice. You just fill up your water and go. Wow. Um, cool. It is a nice feeling that you don't have to pack a suitcase and everything's with you. So um, nice. yeah, people love adventure, love rock climbing, love skiing, um, and really get in touch with their wet wipes. Then, yeah. then you know, <laughs> because, yeah, you really only get to shower every three days. Um, gotcha. I mean, that's, that's like, my schedule as is living in yeah. a home. So uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be yeah. an issue. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, if you like to ski and you have minimal pee, get yourself a van. <laughs> <Get> yourself oh. <laughs> um, okay. Now we're going to get into the two questions. I ask every single guest that is on the podcast with me. The first is who alive or dead would you most like to throw cold spaghetti at? Cold spaghetti. at. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I feel like all of the real evil players deserve a little bit more than spaghetti. Yeah, but you can also decide if you want a different intention for this this toss. It could be celebratory. It could be, uh, you know, comedic. It could be whatever you want it to be. Who would I throw old spaghetti at? <laughs> Probably Lucille Ball. I feel like she would react really well. <laughs> that would be great. It would become like a 20-minute bit that would <laughs> be iconic. The Lucille Ball reunion, kids. <laughs> yes, I love that. Yeah, I'm going to hologram Lucille Ball and throw spaghetti at her. Oh, yeah. I pay. I buy tickets. Uh, okay. The other question I ask every single guest is to tell us your worst pants shitting story or like a bathroom emergency situation, but you can only tell us in three words or like small phrases. Um, so for example, mine is college jogging front lawn. Wow. Yeah. Big Wow. <laughs> I have a very strong sphincter because I've never done this. Um, um, Congratulations. That might be. Yeah, no, I've never, I've never thankfully or, done it. Well, or like any sort of bathroom emergency scenario that didn't have to be, you know, full on shitting your pants. Okay. It's a P story. Um, okay. This is pre-van life. How do I? I'm going to do a hyphen. So I'm okay. cheating a little bit. Holding okay. dash hands. Okay. Vegas interstate wind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really does tell a story. Yes. Uh, no follow up questions there. I think we could yes. all insert uh, our own creativity and imagination into that situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Now we have a section of the podcast called uh, Deep and Hot, where I'm going to ask you a deep question. And then ask for your hot take on something. So let's start with the deep question. Okay. What do you think is worse? Being unsatisfied in your work or overly identified with your work? Unsatisfied. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Have you ever felt that way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There was a time where... I really just wanted to do unscripted and I thought about going back to school to do documentaries. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And maybe working for production companies that would just have more resources to stories and buying the rights to stories and uh, teams to, to create those stories. Um, so I, I sort of oscillate between which do I prefer, you know, scripted or unscripted. Yeah. Uh, what do you watch? Like when you're, watching do you try to watch tv and movies do you try to like it once you're out of la like keep that out of out of sight out of mind kind of thing I my favorite i mostly watch like outdooring mountaineering docs mm. they're my favorite um, okay do you have recommendations i love documentaries of all kinds so i'm always yeah. taking recommendations for them my favorites are maru with it's like okay. with with an m okay great um, it's a mountain and um, kayaking docs are really great docs. It's a really un, un, underrated sport as far as 
filming Whoa. kayaking docks because um, they're quite difficult to film. But yeah, I didn't even know that was a genre. Oh, yeah. I go to cool. an outdoor do- mountaineering documentary film festival every year. Do you really? Yeah. That's and where. Where is this held? Tell you right. Colorado. Okay. And Fun. so there's like slacklining docks and you know, you know what slacklining is? The, the kind of type rope. Walking. Yeah. 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 The thing that looks absolutely horrifying. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So there's slacklining docks. Um, There's a potluck Thanksgiving every year. Um, It's called the Fruit Bowl in Utah. And they build a, these engineers build a space net in the middle (gasps) of this massive canyon that they call the Fruit Bowl. And um, they slackline out to the middle of the net and they'll base jump off of it. And it's always been this like unofficial (sighs) event um, that people just bring their vans to and potluck Thanksgiving that way. Um. But this, I think the last two years, it's become like an official event. Okay. It's like a map and parking and so forth. But um, gotcha. but yeah, they made a doc about that. That was great. I think it's called the Fruit Bowl. Um, cool. But uh, yeah, the ca- kayaking events, they're great because they run, I mean, talk about scripted st- content, but they run multiple countries, these rivers. Yeah. And so um, a lot of times the U.S. kayaking team will have a number of stories that are usually in the form of an article in some mm-hmm. magazine, but, um, you know, there'll be, there was one where they were, um, running the Amazon river and when it gets into Colombia, they were kidnapped by the FARC. Um, Whoa. And that's story. um, so Holy yeah, the shit. kayakers have really gnarly stories. Um, have you a great climbing. Yeah. Dog. I so, have seen that one. That one. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just so intense. I'm not a super outdoorsy person. Okay. <laughs> but you obviously are. What is there um a sport or any sort of like outdoor activity that you haven't gotten into yet that's like on your list? My brother was a professional rock climber for many years. Cool. And so he has definitely inspired me to become better at rock climbing. Mm. But I am called the pear shape lady. And so <laughs> I'm a pear shape people. So that is not very indicative to climbing. Okay. Um, it's very, it's a very sweet way of telling you that your body's not built for this. No, not built for this. I have really strong finger grips, apparently. Okay. But um, but the, the, the biceps are too small and the butt is too big. Um, gotcha, I, gotcha. I would love to be better at rock climbing. Yeah. What's that community like? It seems like it's got to be very supportive because it's a it, there's danger involved in it. There is. Um, there's a really good doc. Uh, I can always for the doc lady. Uh, yeah. The, the Legend of Fred Becky is a great Ooh. doc about a 94 okay. year old rock climber. <gasps> um, and he was sort of the first dirt bag, so to speak, that okay. would like be like we'll belay for food. And he um wrote all of the best North American climbing routes on McDonald's napkins over wow. the course of like 30 years. Um, cool. And he never bought a cup of McDonald's coffee. Well, I shouldn't say never. He would hold on to the styrofoam cup uh-huh. uh, for like at least a year, if not more, because you get a free cup of coffee <laughs> if you bring the styrofoam cup in. <laughs> yeah. They thought they just thought it would be that same day. They didn't think someone would keep it for over a year. Wow. And so he would buy like a cup of McDonald's and he would get a stack of napkins and that's what he would write his routes on. Wow. And I think like Toshin ended up picking up the book three decades later. Wow. Uh, well, he, he cataloged it quite meticulously and it became the best North American route because he did North American routes because he was such an asshole that he would get kicked off the international expeditions. He <laughs> it seems, yeah, it does Everest. seem he was never like back. <laughs> you have to have a, like a level of, uh, crazy <laughs> fuckery. Yeah. In yeah. your brain that yeah. allows you to put your body in those kind of situations and a level yeah. of like egomania <laughs> to like really believe you can do it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay. Now I'm going to ask for your hot take on something. And I'm curious uh, what you think about this, because it seems like you are getting into a world um, of like doing things, like we said, more intentionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think about social media using it with intention or just generally like what are your thoughts on social media? The tricky thing. I mean, I, I call Instagram the world's photo book because it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I think like everybody else, probably that there's obviously good and bad. I think um, it's cool that it makes the world like a block party. Yeah. Um, you know, people that I've just met, somehow I'm following their sister and I'm like, yeah, they just got back from Switzerland. <laughs> How about, you know? Yeah. Um, or you get your van happens because of a DM. Uh, like the connectivities, yeah. but I'm always curious because 
you have this kind of duality of like getting into the real world so much and then also playing in this like fantasy world in Hollywood and part of the brand and job of like being in, you know, LA or whatever and working on projects is like promotion and marketing and using that those kind of like tools. Uh So I wonder like what if you genuinely enjoy it or if it's like part of the gig kind of situation for you or Uh both. I think it's both. Yeah, I, I think there is a duality with, within all of us that you, it's it's hard to polarize it one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I struggle with, you know, I, I filmed this, the YouTube series just simply because I do think Steve's build, the builder I built with, it, yeah. is one of the best builds for a 144 Sprinter. And that is not on the internet. And so mm. um, there is no shower and toilet build for a 144 Sprinter like he built it. It's yeah. because it hides in plain sight. And so mm. I was like, we should, ha- we should film that. That's it. That's important. Yeah. Um, because I, I think other people could use this, the, the plan, so to speak for this build, even though you don't get plans in a, in a YouTube series, but, um, sure. but yeah, so I felt that that was important. Um, and that kind of ties in with social media for me mm-hmm. that I struggle with being an actor, but not being a very good vlogger. Um, and they're not the same thing. <laughs> yeah, they're, they are very, yeah, they, they're, they're very two different. different worlds of content creation. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, part of me loves couples that share their entire marriage on Instagram because there is something about community, even digitally, mm-hmm. that it's like, yeah, they're selling out. But at the same time, what's wrong with if it's going to help their career mm. and it helps other people? And yes, they're absolutely yeah. overstepping boundaries and oversharing. <laughs> there is, you know, there is, Brene Brown is right on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, be- I absolutely agree. Yeah. But at the same time, I think, okay, what are the pros and cons to that? And being these shells that are just posting like very abstract artsy photos on yeah. their, ins- you know, you have those actors mm-hmm. and that, that are really saying nothing. Um, that the 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 secrecy really doesn't make friends very well um, yeah and so I think that's interesting yeah so you know being part of a very active digital community with bands mm-hmm. I do lend to maybe the oversharing kind but I, I don't on my Instagram but I I sort of juggle with like should I really lean into the vlogger world try sure. and get better at it and and cross that boundary into oversharing territory but the people that i follow that quote unquote overshare for a living i i really do love them i i, yeah. I am invested no, i'm alive I'm, for the ride i'm so, with you i know that it's like who am i to oh. say that what they're doing is wrong if it works yeah. for them and if yeah. it like is something they enjoy doing i can say that it makes me nervous but that's my own that's my own projections of going i don't know exactly. that i could consistently put out that much transparency and, and why feel couldn't comfortable we, why, why are we, why are we uncomfortable with that? And so I think that, yeah. you know, I think there's a judgment in why we're uncomfortable. I think because society judges the oversharers, mm. even though they relish in the oversharers. Mm. And so I, w- I do think, you know, okay, as an actress, you're supposed to be a bit coy, but why is that the case? Yeah. And so um, it's something I struggle with. I mean, I think I do plan on, on filming my travels and cool. It's something that, uh, it's a weird beast. I, I am not the psychologist of focus group it, but I would be very <laughs> interested to read studies that have. <laughs> I know it's fascinating to me, but I do think that you coming from the perspective and point of view of going, I made this YouTube series because I saw in my own experience that something I was looking for online didn't exist. And if I'm going to do it in real life, what a gift can it be to someone else in the future that wants to know how to do this? Yeah, like and, and- I was. Two clients have uh, reached out to the now they awesome. have the two builders I built with now the van company and called Nowhere Vans. Check Sweet. them out. And awesome. yeah, and the two came from the YouTube series. Uh, well, they've built nine this year, but the two of Amazing. them came from from them. Yeah. So Sweet. Um, okay, we're gonna take one last break. When we get back, we're gonna answer a quick question that has been submitted by a listener. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Let's um, offer some unprofessional advice, shall we? I think you might have a great perspective to help this person. (laughs) 
They said um, they need some career advice. They're 30 years old and they've made a good career for themselves in technology. They work and currently work for um, have worked for some big companies across a variety of industries. The work is interesting and they genuinely genuinely like it a lot. Um, but part of them is questioning whether to stay the course with their current career or to shift to something else. They're tired of staring at their laptop all day and wish what they did was more tangible. There's also a part of them that's tired of working for big corporations and wants to move away from that. Uh, any advice on making a big and potentially risky career change? You want to go first? My thoughts are if you you can like your job and you can also hate feeling stuck in it. Um, and there's just part of me that goes, if you have an itch, you should eventually scratch it. That uh, The itch might go away, but it'll probably come back at some point. Um, but it's great to be so thoughtful, I think, uh, and consider it rather than just rash and jumping into something and trying to think through like, is this a fleeting feeling or is this a, a deep seated like need that for my soul to replenish itself? Because I do think like burnout in a career is for real. And I do think that sometimes souls can get a bit like uh, barren when they're overworked in the same thing that doesn't nurture them and that it needs a little change of scenery to, to shake things up and get it, uh, get it going again. I mean, I have a probably very cliche answer and, you know, my choices I've chosen in life, but evolutionarily, we're not supposed to be staring at a screen. So it's just mm. logical that one would feel uh, claustrophobic doing mm -hmm. that on a long-term basis. I would say if they have a hobby that they're interested yeah. in, um, if they have an idea of a second career, a second life, uh, that they should pursue it as a hobby first mm. and as a side project and see how far they can take that in, let's call it a six month block. And also in that six month block, look at your savings and see how, yeah. um, what you could yield even on like a conservative basis, like yeah. yielding five, three to 5%. And could you live on that? and uh start living start making a plan to live on less so yeah, that maybe, yeah, yeah. you know in six to 12 months you can take that hobby and uh, your sort of new lifestyle and yeah. be prepared to walk away from that job because i think um we have one life and mm -hmm. the pandemic especially anyone who's in the corporate rigmarole the rat race yeah. I woke up. I, I've always lived in the circus freak, you know. <laughs> same, same. But no, I have family right. members that have really questioned a lot of uh, what they have been doing for years because they were confronted with it every uh -huh. single day in ways that uh, they weren't before. Yeah. So that would be my advice is, is um, live on less and mm. come up with a strategy to do that. And uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully in six to 12 months, you'll have that answer. I think that's super practical while also giving them the like permission to chase whatever the more whimsical, tangible thing is. I totally agree with you that being this uh, screen centered is going to rattle your brain and burn your brain out a little bit. And so, yeah, if there's something that you can attempt to kind of experiment with on the side and like a, a safe and like, um, you know, con more controlled situation and see if it really makes sense and then try to try to grow it. Do you think about career alternatives outside of the entertainment industry? I really like anthropology, um, mm. but ideally that would be going back and getting a master's, if not a PhD, yeah. to pursue that career. And um, I think it's not all that different from acting. It's studying mm. people. It's studying yeah. cultures and so different cultures than my, my own. So yeah, I would, I would, I would, I thought about it. I've thought about it a lot, but mm -hmm. I think ultimately um, there's too many aspects of walking away from the entertainment industry that I would miss. Yeah. Um, but I'm not opposed to, to transitioning within this industry and, yeah. and working for a company that would, would let me scout stories. Um, cool. Because as an actor, yes, you can start production companies, but it's easier said than done. And yeah. resources really are hard to wrangle. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I can see you doing that. I can see you. You seem like a person, like you said in the beginning, that is really impassioned by storytelling and really looking for real people and connecting with real people about uh, really 
fascinating life story. So I'm excited to see what you end up doing. Um, US tentpole movies and a few more just interesting, <laughs> interesting stories, I think, are desperately needed. Yeah, of um, course. Our industry. So um, before we wrap up completely, we like to give our guests a little token of our appreciation for making time for us. And that is a personalized horoscope that Melissa has just texted to you in oh, cool. uh, the chat. Uh, we are not astrologers, <laughs> just like we're not therapists. So nope. <laughs> feel free to read it aloud for the class. Great. Dear Libra, scales of the stars in the second half of the month. You're all about embracing romance into your life, regardless of relationship status. But if he drives a Volkswagen, well, there's probably a good chance he will, um, and fails out of law school under weird circumstances, maybe it's best to avoid. The stars. Wow. The stars have huh. some thoughts. That is uh, very funny. We'll see and what it, happens. Um, if you take him to leave law school, maybe then it's a, it's you can still stay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, Holland, where can people find you and everything that you're up to if uh, they don't already know? Oh, gosh. Well, I frequent Los <laughs> Angeles a lot. So just do enough digging to find my address. Um, right. And I, uh, I'm i on Instagram under under Holland Roden and same, same name under Twitter. And mm. I have a YouTube channel, which I don't post on um, <laughs> often. I know. It's been uh, like 10 months. I'm yeah, excited yeah. and hope when yeah. you said that you might be posting more stuff in the future, I'm going, yes, please. They're I, fun and cool. I, yeah. When I, when I film, I don't, I don't post and I've been thankfully, very thankfully, um, I just Working. wrapped a couple movies movies the last couple months and, and I'm on Mayans on FX, um, for this past season oh, and, yeah. um, and yeah. And then maybe out on the road. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, this has been super fun. Guys, go check out everything she's up to. Go get yourself a van. Get out on the road. Um, and I have a billion documentaries to watch, which I really appreciate all the recommendations. Of course. Yeah. We'll see you guys next time on another episode of Not Too Deep. Goodbye. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Not too deep. Not too deep. Grace Helbig. Not Too Deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated, producer Melissa D. Montz, edited by Shireen Lani Yunus, post-production sound by Chris Henry, and an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. <laughs> <laughs>